Good. You ready? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day three of the IP Showcase Theater uh, here at IBC 19. Uh, we have a full slate of presenters this morning, so I'm um, looking forward to uh, having some really interesting technical content. Uh, we're going to start off with a nice presentation from Thomas Kernan uh, of Mellanox, who's going to give us some of um, his perspective on how to uh, avoid traps and pitfalls in uh, 2110 systems. So take away, Thomas. Thank you, Wes. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, making your way to the showcase on this uh, sunny Sunday morning. I assume it's sunny outside. I haven't seen. Um, yes, so as, uh, as Wes pointed out, uh, this is about uh, avoiding traps and pitfalls when designing PTP networks for um, broadcast uh, industry using the 2059 profile. The idea I had when I uh, wanted to create this deck was just to remind people that uh, there are a number of decisions you need to make and that your decisions and your network is always unique and therefore there is more of a process about what you should be thinking about. So some people see PTP as this extremely complex system. Okay, we're not designing the International Space Station. It's not a problem, it's less complex than that. You're not in either at CERN designing the LHC, although the LHC actually uses PTP. Um, but these are nevertheless complex systems on which you want to come up with some form of blueprint which corresponds to what you are building. We all want to run a tight ship. We would ideally like everything to be perfectly aligned, well-designed, properly integrated. That's what we're after. And we need it to be performing according to the metrics that we've defined. And those metrics, again, depend on the use case, on what it is you're putting together, how you're putting the system together, and what are your requirements. So all of this put together tends to be, oh, I've got a very complex system I need to build we're transitioning from one industry to the other. But it is not as complex as one may think. It's just usually a new uh, system that is being designed for which we don't maybe have all the proper bases, hence why I'm going to try and help you out here. But you'd still need to make it something that is entirely functional in the way that you had it with other systems. What are the two key parts of PTP that we're trying to deal with? First of all, it's time. We need to make sure we have an entire system that is co-timed and that can perform with the sources and the receivers that we're designing. And the other part, of course, is accuracy, okay? And accuracy comes in many different forms, and we need to try and make sure that we hit the bullseye and that we actually have a highly accurate and precise system in order to synchronize everything together. Now, since it's the first session of the morning on PTP, I do have a couple of uh, points that I want to remind people. We're designing this around a well-known and established standard called IEEE 1588, for which SEMT and AES respectively have designed their own profiles. In the case of SEMT, it's called 2059-2. It defines the parameters that are part of the standard that are used specifically uh, to focus on the way that systems are being built in a 2110 system, for example. Uh, one of the points that is usually discussed is uh, the slave to grandmaster maximum offset, which is usually rounded to one microsecond. In many cases, that means actually plus or minus 500 nanoseconds in the way that things are uh, actually deployed. What we're always looking for are well-disciplined endpoints. We can build a fantastic infrastructure, but your endpoints still need to be well-designed. Okay? They need to be well-designed for day-to-day -day operation. They need to be well-designed for corner cases. They need to be well designed for when the system actually is in some way impacted, but still need to keep you on air, like we did with Black and Burst. An endpoint is about a PTP stack. A PTP stack is something that is actually not defined in the IEEE standard on how it needs to be built. That is part of every vendor's implementation. Okay? It tells you what needs to come in, how it needs to come out, but the secret source that's within is vendor dependent, which means that you will have a wide variety of implementations in the industry, and you need to understand what you're working against. So the way the stack is built and its stability, and how filters and control loops have been implemented. 
Those are all important components of a PTP stack. The other part, of course, is the design of the network itself. How do we transport the timing across the network? And we make sure that we have the uh, required accuracy. So there, whilst you may design networks which are non-PTP aware, I would say the general consensus today is using PTP aware devices. So that means they actually have a hardware ability for managing PTP. Typically in a network device that is either what we call a boundary clock, okay, a device that will actually act as a boundary between two different parts of the system, or transparent clocks. Usually the next question I get is, which one should I use? And as we all love, the best answer is it depends, because it depends on your network, what you're building, what you're trying to achieve, the scope, the scalability, the number of endpoints. So there is no silver bullet answer for this. But the goal is to try and discuss what are the points you should be thinking about, and hopefully that will help you reach your own conclusions as to what it is that you should be using. Next question is, what could possibly go wrong in designing this? Well, number one, like any project, you've got deadlines. Deadlines means you've got constraints. Constraints means you can operate within a finite time of what the industry can provide you at that point. You will build with what is available. You may wish for something else, but you will build with what's available because you have a deadline. Number two, of course, is PTP is a new technology. So planning may be something that is different from the way you used to do it, and you need to adapt processes and so on. Or lack of experience, because as I said, it's a new technology, and we need to learn. In-depth testing, oh, that PTP thing, oh, I had two devices in the lab, they locked must work. Now, what happens when I've got 100 devices, 1,000 devices, 10,000 devices, or that I've decided to integrate this new product at a last minute, which, for whatever reason, has different requirements from the rest? How deep do I need to go into my testing? Again, I'll tell you it depends, obviously, but these are things you need to keep in mind. Um, how did I define the quality metrics for the different gates of my project? This is a new system. How deep do I need to go into it? These are all questions which I'm talking about you know, project management at this point in time. But in the projects I've been involved with, these are the first questions you need to answer way before you get into, into any of the technical details. And then, as I said, you know, it's a finite snapshot in time. You've got limitations. Um, you need to figure out how you're going to work around, obviously, because you know, the system is there, but what are the workarounds to get to the system that you need to achieve, which is not the same as someone else who is building in the same time frame as you on another continent or in the next city or down the road. Everyone has different requirements. One thing that I do like to remind people is we're all human, and there is the so-called unscheduled uh, personal events. People go on holiday, people get ill, unfortunately, uh, people change jobs. These do impact these projects. And the last one always is, oh, but there's that other urgent project we need to take care of, which always seems to be lurking in the background. So this slide is all about you know, project management per se, but this is the first level at which you're going to start sorting out what you want to work on. Unfortunately, the clock is ticking, and you've got a project to deliver. So this is all very nice theory, but what does that mean? So we're going to go to you know, back to the pyramid of what is it that you need to think about. So your timing strategy. Lots of questions around, you know, message rates and what should I do? And, you know, I've seen many projects where people have decided to change what were the commonly established defaults. And there are very good reasons for doing that. There's no problem with that. The problem is don't underestimate the impact. You have maybe have solved problem A. You maybe have not impacted solution B, but you have not realized that you've created a, a real problem with you know, solution C. So these things don't live in a vacuum. They are all interlinked in the way how your products are operating. You must be consistent within your entire PTP domain. I've seen deployments where people will have different values on different parts of the system. That is a very effective means of making sure you'll run into trouble further down the line because part of the system will be living in a certain state and another part of the system will be living in another state. By doing so, you may have either a, a split, shall we say, or more to the point, you will have uh, systems that are trying to recalibrate themselves all the time. You may or may not detect it. 
depending on what you've put into place for monitoring, which we'll talk about later. Again, if we change the default values, test, test the test corners that you have and test again. And you'll hear me say that a lot. Another one that I used to uh, come across is people like to use what I call the sledgehammer. So in the theory around PTP, you have an election process to elect a grandmaster, obviously, and there should only be one at any point in time. Um, and there is a set of values in the data set for the best master clock algorithm, which allows you to define you know, these values. So some of them are de derived from the timing source, such as a GPS or so on. Others, such as the priority one and priority two values, are ones that are user defined, okay? Priority one sounds great, but it's a sledgehammer. If you use that, no matter what happens to your primary source, it may still always be the primary reference source, even though the clock has been degraded and you've been running free running for the last two minutes, two hours, or two months. So I try to ten <coughs> tell people they should use more of a, a subtle approach, as if you were an archaeologist which was using a little brush to try and clean something up and just whack a mole. And the priority two is a little more um, effective to that uh, effect. Uh, where do I connect the spine? Uh, sorry, the grandmasters. Another question. Spine leaf, leaf spine. Honestly, it depends. And if it's well designed, it shouldn't really make a difference. Other than ports availability in a well designed system that you decide to have your grandmasters that are running off the leaves in a distributed manner or directly connected to the spine. Again, I insist in a well designed system. There may be constraints that are required that you have to put it in one place or another, but from a pure PTP point of view, and the architectures we're talking about, this should not be an issue per se. So now we've done some of the timing strategy, let's look at some of the network design. So I came back already, I said before, you know, should we run PTP or aware or non-aware infrastructure? In my personal opinion, it should be PTP aware, just make your life simpler. Don't worry about having uh, non-aware devices. There's been a number of publications in the past uh, that explain the impact of non-PTP aware devices, where you would have a lot of the traffic that is not only sent to the CPU, but is also more to the point, uh, a lot of jitter that's created around that, and that will impact either part or all the system. So as a baseline, make sure that you have something that's got hardware timestamping in it, and that is uh, well-defined in terms of, and well-bound and tested in terms of its PTP implementation. Transparent clock versus boundary clock, it's the same thing. It will depend the architecture of the network you're building, what you want to connect to it, where it gets connected, the density in terms of the number of devices that are connected per, uh, per realm, okay? If you have too many devices, you might have too much traffic that is being accumulated across the different PTP devices, and they have to discard a lot of traffic, which could put load on your uh, endpoints, your, your media nodes, your slaves, which in that case will start to be dysfunctional, indirectly not due to themselves, but due to the cumulative traffic that they need to filter out. Some filter in software, some filter in hardware. Again, the answer is it depends, but you need to be aware of that. So a lot of people like to use boundary clocks in order to create that bound, uh, that boundary, sorry, I mean, in which you're going to uh, contain the amount of PTP traffic that it's gonna be on every single port of uh, your network devices. But again, it's not one versus the other. It depends what you need to put together. And there are many architectures out there that combine both of them. Transport, uh, the 70 standard defines they can use IPv4 or IPv6. Now, whilst I understand that a lot of people are still struggling, not struggling, but trying to move to IP, and therefore IPv4 is a lot easier to, let's say, grasp on round one. IPv6 does have a few of its own advantages, and we have been involved in customer projects which require IPv6 for PTP transport. Many of them are trying to treat PTP as a management protocol, and have decided in their strategy that all their management traffic is IPv6 as a way to separate. It's a choice, you don't have to, you may or may not want to. Um, and as part of that, there's also uh, some of the features that come in IPv6, which can be interesting other than trans transporting the PTP messages in the same way. Uh, there's a concept in IPv6 called link local addresses, which means you have only IP addresses that are used on the direct layer two domain in which you are. So the traffic is always contained. So if you're in a, in a boundary clock environment, that traffic will never go beyond the next hop. In a PTP non-aware environment, of course, that's more of a problem, but in a PTP aware environment with boundary clocks where everything is self-contained, 
that exists. And there are other protocols in IPv6 uh, which are well deployed on very large scale which use the exact same techniques for communicating between their, their neighbors. Then the next question usually is multicast, mix, unicast, what should I be using? Uh, the default is usually multicast. That's the way you can uh, distribute as many messages. Um, mixed mode is of interest to many people because we reduce uh, part of the load on the endpoint specifically because half of the amount of the communication is now directly with the, uh, the master itself. Unicast may be used to cross wide area or being able to statically nail who is talking to who. So again, I would say multicast and mixed mode tend to be the two preferred uh, messaging uh, transports. Unicast may be used in some environments uh, for specific um, connections between masters and, uh, and slaves. PTP uh, message path selection. I, I hinted before that uh, we are aware of customers using IPv6 uh, for their management and want to treat it as a management. So just like in the uh, traditional world with SDI and Black and Burst, you do not need to have your PTP that is in line with your essence, okay, your media essence. It can come in from another channel as long as it's locked and synced to the device you're working with. Okay? So it can come through a, a separate PTP network or a management network or another branch of the network or another VLAN or whatever it may be. Okay? So as part of that, not only you can do a separation saying it runs on another part of the network or a management network, but you can also do PTP traffic isolation. You may decide that you want to have it contained depending on vendor implementations, using VLANs to separate the traffic, using uh, port aggregation lag uh, in, in another way where you have multiple links that are connected for redundancy and through that you want to carry PTP across uh, those links and or uh, via VRFs where you have virtualization functions and you can actually do separation uh, in another way for the traffic. So these are all different models and again it depends on the design. My goal here is to say, this is the toolkit, these are the options, look at what it is that you may want to use in your design that corresponds to the efficiency and the um, isolation you want to provide for that type of traffic. The last point I wanted to raise around the network design, and this is, relates to uh, some of the earlier implementations where uh, there is management uh, TLVs that exist in 2059, uh, and there's been issues with some of the behavior. If you are isolating part of the traffic, if you have a uh, design where you can actually do part of the isolation of the, of the PTP traffic, you may be able to contain some of these issues that occurred in early implementations, which, to be honest, to the greatest extent, have been fixed by the different uh, vendors that are out there, uh, and that's a good thing. But you can use, again, traffic isolation for PTP as a means to maybe protect further uh, the infrastructure in order to not impact other devices. So these are all concepts and ideas that you can try and apply based on what is available from various network uh, vendors out there in terms of the features that you may want to put in or not. Oops. So, rolling back to the basics. So we're back to day one, and the first thing, of course, is we're talking also about security. And this is not security that's specific to PTP in any shape or form. This is the 101 of what you need to be running in a well designed and contained network. So you need some form of authorization uh, and authentication and accounting for connecting to any single devices. Any devices that are open and unauthenticated are not going to serve you well in the long process once you're up and running beyond the lab. Uh, there are different ways of doing that. You can use access lists to filter out on all your interfaces who can connect to what because it is, you know, it is a standard and a protocol that is core to the stability of the infrastructure, so you want to treat it in that way. You want to make sure you're using encrypted transports and only encrypted transports to connect for the sessions to those devices, it being SSH or HTTPS or what other means. As I call out again, no unprotected interfaces. Unfortunately, there are implementations out there which still today, if you have access to it, logical access, you don't have to log in, you don't have to do anything, and you can go and disrupt. And I'm not uh, wanting to point on to anything specific, but it is a potential risk. So you can contain that through a management network, but you need to understand that even though you might design a great PTP infrastructure, your endpoints themselves still need to also be part of that design. 
Don't forget the physical ports too. There are too many you know, console ports, serial ports, auxiliary ports, front panels, which are not locked down, which you need to lock down as part of securing your infrastructure. Uh, disable the un uh, unused services, that thing that's running but no one knows about, which no one has dealt with for years. Uh, the interfaces, the protocols they're not using. If you don't know what it's for, then either shut it down until someone screams, obviously do that before you're in production, uh, or understand what its purpose is. And then the threat modeling. You know, you've got to understand, now that I've got all this that's designed, how can I still throw things at it and poke holes and understand how I can mitigate? And the same applies, obviously, to the network itself. You want to use traceable sources, time sources. You need source diversity. You want antenna diversity. You want to have uh, your sources to be frequency and time uh, traceable. And there are flags in PTP that will tell you that. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you've designed the network to do so. There are features such as acceptable master table, which is a standard uh, IEEE 1588 uh, standard, um, feature, sorry which allows you to create a whitelist of which clock IDs should I be listening to uh, in case a device that is unknown tries to be elected as the master. It may be legit, but you might want to make sure that in advance you've whitelisted who are the possible candidates. And that helps you against uh, remote devices that are beyond the direct uh, hop where you're connected to. The other model which is implemented, I think, now by all major uh, network vendors is a s concept of a forced master role on the port of a boundary clock specifically, where any device that's connected to it, which may be trying to advertise itself as being better than the current grandmaster, the messages are discarded. Ideally, they're logged too, so you have an idea of what's going on, but prevent uh, you know, stability issues around the network. And again, in the same way, you should do threat modeling for the host, you should do threat modeling for the... Uh, for the network itself. One thing I really, really, really want to draw your attention to is monitoring. It is great that we build secure infrastructures. It is great that we come up with these models of how we need to do uh, the network. But it is extremely important that you have some sort of dashboarding through whatever means you have, either dedicated product, a broadcast controller, a network controller, both, because you might have different teams that work in different ways, and you need visibility. You need to have health overview of your infrastructure. Remember, the synchronization is still the underlying component of all the systems that you're building on top. It may be done through message captures, online or offline. It may be done through alarms that you trigger when you reach certain offsets and you want it to be um, raised. It may potentially also be through um, having a certain number of devices which have a one PPS output where you can do out-of-band signal comparison between the reference source and the endpoints. So I'm not saying go and rebuild an entire coax infrastructure like you did for Black and Burst. I'm saying you might want to have selective canaries in the cold mine which are there to tell you when you have uh, systems that are being drifted and that you may not be aware of because you don't have a full picture. And the last point is there's a slave port monitoring concept that exists uh, from some specific vendors, and now there's a model that's been standardized in the upcoming version of uh, the uh, 1588 standard. So there is a plethora of methods that you want to combine in order to give yourself a good understanding of the state of your PTP infrastructure. Diversity and failure testing. We obviously want to design for diversity, and uh, 2110 using Dash 7 is very good for media from that point of view. Um, but one needs to understand that PTP redundancy is not a standard feature. It does not exist in either the 70 profile definition, nor does it exist in the 1588 specification per se. Other industries have spent extensive amount of time designing specifics around how to do redundancy in their um, respective industries and it is not a task to be um, taken lightly. There are attempts to drive more work in that space, and I think it's a very good thing, but there are definitions about it that relate to stack implementations, and as I've called out before, PTP stacks and the intricacies of the stack itself and the inner um, design is specific to the implementation, so again, there needs some sort of coordination on how this needs to, uh, how it needs to work. So, Different designs means different results, which comes back to my motto of test, test, test. So you need to test for partial and total failure. Okay, don't assume that because you've designed it the way you think it is, the theory will work uh, in the same way in the practice. 
what are the metrics, what are you looking for? When you simulate those um, uh, partial total failures, what are the metrics you define to understand what you're trying to break and how it reacts? The recovery time, what's the most important? That the media or the PTP recovers and in what time? What is gating that? Is it because it's a device that takes longer to boot? Is it because uh, there's a piece of software in there that is uh, not designed right now to have a fast boot mode or, or operate in this type of environments? And last question, is it really important to reduce? Do you need to maybe bring your system uh, up time down by um, one minute, two minutes, five minutes? It entirely depends on what you're building. So there is no general metric for that, but this is part of what you should understand when you design for this. What is it you're trying to um, build for? What are your targets? And then, of course, the truth, you know, vision versus reality is always about a compromise. So do your research, speak to your vendors, um, not only the data sheets. We might all have great data sheets, but talk to people to understand how things operate in the real world. Uh, research existing projects, but remember every project is unique. It's not a blueprint. It's just the way it was designed, again, in that time uh, for those requirements. There are a number of industry publications. There are reference designs, again, out there. But these are things you need to take into account. Uh, you know, we're still early days for many in this space. So there is limited experience. There's inaccuracies in the way that people are communicating results. Uh, they might be getting the message across, but because it's in a certain scope or you don't have the full picture, you might not understand it the way that it was actually being provided or vice versa. Um, so there's always a need to compromise. Build your common baseline, your operating model of what you need, and that will tell you from where you can start and to where you can go. So in the couple of minutes I've got left, uh, briefly, make a plan, stick to it. The worst thing you can do is not have a plan, okay? It might not be the best plan, it might not be the ideal plan, it might not be the engineer's dream plan, but have a plan and stick to it. Otherwise, it just gets worse. Test and validate, test and validate your design methodology, uh, what your vendors have announced uh, versus what they actually do. Uh, that includes everybody in the industry. End-to-end uh, -end test, always test end-to-end, -end, not just the different components, and test with the failure scenarios so you understand how all the bits work together. We collectively as vendors are out there to listen to customers, so you know it should be a constructive process. Bugs exist, and they will always exist, but work together around limitations. Uh, schedule the fixes, the enhancements, does it meet, meet your timeline? You know, what are, what are the deal breakers in what you can achieve within a certain time? And finally, mitigate uh, the implementations uh, once everything else has been tried, tested, and done. You're like, okay, this is as far as I can go. This is a timeline I have. Now I need to make a decision. We're going to do this versus that. And at the end, it's about plan, test, rinse, and repeat. Obviously, all PTP networks should, in theory, be equal, but in reality, some are more than others. Uh, your network is, just like you, unique. Um, you know, slight differences, big impacts. Let's make sure that we're aware of that. Different message rates, different uh, devices, different implementations, different software releases, all this comes into account. So plan ahead, you know, mitigate the limitations, plan around it, test again, again, again. I'm not saying you should spend your life testing, but there is a lot that still needs to be learned in order to get this fine-tuned for your own needs. That was me just in time, I hope. And uh, thank you very much. And I hope this was useful for you. Well, thank you, Thomas. And um, thank you for um, getting us off to a good start this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, if somebody's got a tiny 30-second question, I can, we can take it. Or I'll be here afterwards if you okay. want to. So um, that's fine. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, switch over.